Father in heaven, how we desperately need the Lord Jesus Christ, not just to be justified in the beginning of our salvation, but every single day, every single step along the way between here and glory. Lord, he is everything to us. And we pray, Lord, you'd make him even bigger and greater and more glorious in our minds and hearts today as we look into your word. We pray that you would transform us from one image to another image, from a life of sin to a life of holiness and devotion to Christ. So open up your word to our hearts today, Lord. Let us see Jesus in his risen, resurrected, glorified position that he holds today. Lord, if there's anyone that is lost that is in this room, I pray that, Lord, you would save their soul. Open up their eyes and bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. May they, may they live because of his resurrection life. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, read along with me, please. Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his ears were like a flame of fire. I'm sorry, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it, it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. I don't know how many of you have ever read C.S. Lewis's fictional book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. A few of you. If you haven't read it, you should. But I'm going to quote a little bit from that book. This is a fictional account, but in this fictional story, there's a lion named Aslan. And Aslan represents Jesus Christ in Lewis's understanding in his theology and in his books. And in this little book, um, Lucy, one of the four children that enter the wardrobe and go into Narnia, Lucy has a conversation with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And this is how it goes. Is, is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan, a man? said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood. And the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion. The lion. The great lion. Oh, said Susan. I would thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie. And make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just plain silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. And that's exactly what the Apostle John is going to discover about Jesus Christ as he receives these visions in Revelation. He's going to understand that Jesus Christ is God. He is not safe. He cannot be domesticated. He cannot be tamed by us. But he is good. Now in Revelation chapter 1, John describes a vision of Jesus Christ that he has been given... And we, we find out in verse 9 that he's been exiled to an island called Patmos. Patmos was in the Aegean Sea. Like if you get a map, a map out from the back of your Bible and you find Ephesus, if you go basically left, <laughs> about 37 miles offshore, you're going to run into an island called Patmos. It was small. It was only 5 miles by 10 miles long. And it was made up of volcanic rock. 
So here he's exiled to be in total isolation all by himself on this volcanic rocky island. And it's there that the Lord Jesus communicates visions of himself and visions of what is going to take place to his servant. And it also tells us in verse 10 that John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day probably refers to the first day of the week, the day Jesus rose from the dead. So on a Sunday morning or Sunday, the Lord Jesus appears to John and John is in the spirit and he's seeing amazing visions that come from Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus tells John that he needs to write down the things he's going to show them and send them to seven different churches that existed in John's own day. So these are John's marching orders. See the visions, write them down, and send those visions out to seven different churches. And that's where we're going to pick up this morning in the vision that Jesus gave to John. And as we work our way through this amazing vision in chapter 1, I just want to look at three things. Number one, what did John see? Number two, what did John do? And number three, what did John hear? What did he see? What did he do? And what did he hear? So in verses 12 to 16, we see what John sees. In verse 17, we find out what he does. And in verse 17 and 18, we're going to discover what he hears. Okay? What did John see? Now, remember, as we work our way through this description of the resurrected Christ, we should not take this literally. If you take this description literally, you're going to think that Jesus literally walks around with a sword hanging out of his mouth. But he doesn't do that. So it's, these are symbols, and the symbols are intended to communicate truth to us. Now the first thing we see in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man. And we'll stop right there. He saw one like a son of man. Now Jesus' favorite title for himself was son of man. As you go through the Gospels and read the Gospels, that's the one he uses about himself most often. But this is actually not a new description. We find it in the Old Testament. And in fact, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, we find Daniel speaking about the son of man. I want to read that to you. This is Daniel 7, 13. Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days. The ancient of days is God the Father. Here is the son of man coming up to God the Father. I believe this took place at Jesus' ascension into heaven after he rose from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He was presented before the ancient of days. And to him, to Jesus, to the son of man, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So this refers to Christ, having been raised from the dead, ascends to heaven, he appears before God the Father, and God the Father gives him some things. God the Father gives him glory and a kingdom. And this is a kingdom that will never pass away. So here we see the unrivaled sovereignty of Jesus Christ. This dominion that extends over all nations and peoples everywhere. And this kingdom that that grows and expands throughout the world. We're taught to pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're taught to pray that Jesus' glory, his dominion and kingdom will extend to more and more people throughout the world and more people come under his rule and his reign. So what we see right out of the gate in this vision, that it's, it's not a calming and soothing vision at all. It's a terrifying vision. This vision of Christ scares John. In fact, Jesus has to tell him, do not be afraid. In the middle of the lampstands is the Son of Man. We find that in verse, verse 12. 
or excuse me, verse 13. In the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man. Well, what in the world do these lampstands represent? What are they symbolic of? Well, look down to verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the Son of Man is in the midst of the churches. These seven churches of Asia Minor that existed in John's own day, Jesus is walking in the midst of them. I believe that is telling us that Jesus Christ was ministering to his churches. He's in their midst. And they're like lampstands. And lampstands need to, um, they, they need maintenance because they run out of oil. They need someone to come and trim the wick. Jesus Christ is ministering or serving his churches by trimming the wick, adding fresh oil so that the light from the churches would b burn brightly and shine forth gloriously in the midst of a dark world that they were a part of. Now we're told in verse 13 that he, he's clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. The word sash occurs 10 times in the Old Testament and eight of those 10 times it refers to either the high priest or his sons who are other priests. This is a priestly garment. The high priest would wear a robe going down to the ground and he'd have a golden sash across his chest. This is picturing Jesus as the high priest of his church. Now folks, what does a priest do? What's his function? To minister. To minister. Yeah, that's right. And he ministers by offering sacrifice and making intercession for the people. Now Jesus Christ has already made sacrifice, offered himself as a sacrifice upon the cross to atone for sin and to propitiate God's wrath, to remove the wrath of God against sinners. Christ has already made sacrifice, but now he is in heaven at the right hand of God making intercession for the saints. He's pleading for God's people. He's asking God to continue to be merciful and to strengthen them for this journey that we face while we go through life. So here we have the ministering priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, wearing the robe, wearing the sash, having already made sacrifice and now making intercession on behalf of his people. And the next description is that his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. This is the exact same description that we have in Daniel 7, 9 of the Ancient of Days, which refers to God the Father. The Bible there says that his head and hair were white like wool, like snow. So here's one of the many indications in the book of Revelation that suggests that Jesus is God. Because it takes a description of God the Father, the Ancient of Days, and applies it to God the Son. Linking the two together, Jesus is deity, he's divine. And this white head and the white hair suggest his infinite wisdom and holiness. White being the color for purity, but also a white head refers to uh, an old person who has great wisdom over, gained through many years of life. And then we're told his eyes were like a flame of fire. That very description is repeated in Revelation 2.18 when Jesus writes a letter to the church of Thyatira. It says, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire says this. Well, in that very same letter to Thyatira, we find out that Jesus, in verse 23, searches the minds and the hearts. And in verse 19, it says that he knows all the deeds that we do. Jesus' eyes being a flame of fire tells us that he is omniscient. He knows all about you. He knows all about every one of your sins. You haven't, you haven't hidden anything from the eyes of Jesus Christ. The resurrected Christ knows. His eyes are a flame of fire. It searches to the depths, not just of our outward actions, but our soul and our hearts. He knows the motives of why we do what we do. Everything is laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. His eyes are a flame of fire. You cannot escape anything from his searching eyes. Next, we read that his feet are like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. 
Now in the Old Testament, bronze usually is connected in some way to judgment. We had the brazen altar, that's where sin was judged under the Old Covenant. And here his feet are burnished bronze, meaning that they're red hot. They have been caused to glow in the fire. And so this is speaking about him crushing his enemies and purifying his church. Because a fire purifies metal. We're also told that his voice was like the sound of many waters. Now we've already read this in the book of Revelation, haven't we? And we've likened these many waters to the Niagara Falls, <laughs> standing at the bottom of the falls and having to yell to the guy sitting right next to you so that he can hear you. So this is speaking about a deafening, powerful roar that comes from the mouth of Jesus Christ that no creature can ignore. His description goes further. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Now what in the Bible is referred to as a two-edged sword? Or the sword of the Spirit, what is that? The Word of God. That's right, the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Now in the New Testament, there are two different Greek words for a sword. In Ephesians 6.17, where it talks about the sword of the Spirit, it uses a word that talks about a small sword or actually a large knife, where you can cut up flesh with it. That's not the word he's using here. The word he's using here is a word for a broadsword, one of those big swords that you would take into battle to chop your enemy's heads off, to kill them. That's the sword that is being mentioned here, the broadsword. And this is the sword that we have in Revelation chapter 19, which describes the second coming of Christ. <coughs> Revelation 19.11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Notice this, his eyes are a flame of fire. We just read that. And on his head are many diadems, or crowns. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Folks, that's us. If we die and go to be with the Lord before he returns, we will come back with him, symbolically, on white horses. I don't think we're actually riding a literal horse, but we're coming back with Christ to earth, clothed in white linen, making that we are the righteousness of God in Christ because of our faith in Him. And then verse 15 says, from His mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it He may strike down the nations, and He will rule them with a rod of iron, and He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. I just confess, it's confusing to me how some Christian churches don't believe in the wrath of God when I can't, I can't hardly read for 15 minutes in my Bible without coming across it. Here we're told when Jesus comes back, he's coming back and he's going to tread down his enemies like a wine press of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. So he's going to use that sharp two-edged sword to destroy his enemies, speaking about everlasting destruction in hell eternal punishment. We're also told back in Revelation 1, his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When Paul writes, I think it's 1 Timothy 6, 17, it says that God dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. And here, Jesus appears as the sun shining in its strength. Have you ever tried to look at the sun on a cloudless day with nothing obstructing you and just stare into the sun? Do you know what happens? Your eyes hurt. Your eyes hurt. You, you can have permanent damage done to your eyeballs. and You can actually go blind if you try to stare at it too long. You just don't stare at the sun shining in its strength. But Jesus, when he returns, is going to be like the sun shining in its strength, glorious in every way. 
In fact, when Jesus was transfigured in Matthew 17 too, the Bible says his face shone like the sun. So when Jesus was transfigured, that was a preview of what he's going to be like when he returns. The, the veil was taken away so we could see him as he really is. He was sort of God incognito when he walked the earth. He, he was veiled in flesh. We looked at him and saw oh, there's just another person. No, he's not just another person. When he's transfigured, the veil is removed so his disciples could see him as he truly was. God in the flesh. And so this sun shining in its strength points to his overwhelming glory, his majesty, and his holiness. So this is what John saw in the vision. He saw Christ unveiled. He saw a scary picture of Christ. One who's coming back with a big old broadsword to kill his enemies with it. That sure seems strange to our ears, doesn't it? Because we think of Jesus, meek and mild, the friend of sinners. Well, that's true. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was meek and mild in his first coming. He was a hum humble and condescending. But friends, when he comes back again, he's going to be a roaring lion. He's going to be a lion that will wreak havoc on those who have denied him, rejected him, spurned him, and mocked him. He's going to be, to be their judge when he comes again. Okay, second question. What did John do? We saw what he saw. We've already read what he saw. What did he do? Look at verse 17. When I saw him, what did he do? I fell at his feet like a dead man. That's what he did. He fell down like he was dead. I don't think this was voluntary. I don't think Jesus is, I mean, I'm sorry. I don't think John is falling down voluntarily because he's going to worship him or pray to him. I think this was involuntary because it says he felt like a dead man. Dead people don't fall to the ground voluntarily. Like think about the Civil War. I, I'm kind of a Civil War buff. I like to learn about that. If you think about these soldiers rushing into battle with their rifles and one of them as he's running gets shot in the head, what happens? He's killed instantly and he falls to the ground. He's dead before he even hits the ground. John said, I fell to the ground like a dead man. Involuntarily. He was overcome. I, I don't really understand what it was. I mean, he, maybe he was fainting. Maybe his body couldn't take the stress and the trauma of what he was seeing. And so he just fell because he couldn't help himself. Um, I don't think John is being slain in the spirit. I've, are you guys familiar with that term? Yeah. Charismatics talk, well, especially Benny Hinn and people like him, they like to take their cloak and throw it or whip it at you and 50 people fall down at once. That, that's not what John was going through here. <laughs> he, he's, he's not being slain in the spirit. When you're slain in the spirit, and folks, we, Debbie and I went to a church that did this all the time, and they, get, they have catchers behind you so that when you fall down, you gently are laid to the ground, and they put a blanket over you so that you can rest there. John isn't falling down backwards. There's no catchers, and no one's putting a blanket on him. <laughs> he's falling down like a dead man. We do know whatever happened to John it was terrifying because as soon as he fell down like a dead man, Jesus put his right hand on his shoulder and said, do not be afraid. Now, virtually every time we find God or even an angel appearing to people in the Bible, they responded very similar to what we find here, which was John's response. For example, Judges chapter 13, we find a man named Manoah. He and his wife are visited by an angel of God. And Manoah turns to his wife and said, We will surely die, for we have seen God. In Isaiah chapter 6, the one Anthony just mentioned, we have Isaiah saying a vision of the Lord. We have these seraphim calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the temple's filling with smoke as the train of his robe is filling the temple. And the thresholds are trembling at this great vision. And what does, I, I, what does Isaiah do? Does he stand up and dance and scream hallelujah? He said, woe is me. The word woe is like the word cursed or damned. I am damned. Woe is me. For I am ruined. I'm undone. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips. Is that all, Isaiah? 
You've said a few bad words and you think you're, you're doomed? Isaiah was probably one of the more righteous men in Israel. He was a prophet of God, but yet this righteous man saw his sin in the sight of an all-holy God and he trembled before God. He says, I live amongst the people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And when we ever get a true sight of God and His holiness, all of our sin is exposed before Him. And we bow in the dust, humble to the dust before Him. Let's take Ezekiel. When Ezekiel has a vision of the throne room, in chapter 1, verse 28, he fell on his face. Two chapters later, in chapter 3, verse 23, again, he falls on his face when this vision of the Lord occurs to him. When we come to Daniel in chapter 10, Daniel also has a vision of God. And when he has this vision of God, his friends run away to hide themselves. But Daniel had no strength left in him. Sounds like John, where he fell at his face, on his face like a dead man. He had no strength. His natural color turned to a deathly pallor. He fell into a deep sleep on his face with his face to the ground. So he's falling on his face. His face is pressing against the ground and he's under such a deep sleep that he can't rouse himself. Sounds a little strange to our, our minds today. But it's not just Old Testament. This occurred in the ministry of Jesus. Remember when Jesus took his disciples on the boat across the Sea of Galilee? They were afraid. They were terrified. They woke him up. He, he, Jesus wasn't concerned. He was sleeping. They had to wake him up. He stands up and he rebukes the sea and the winds, and they were stilled before him. And his disciples were very much afraid when they saw what Jesus had done. See, there's something more terrifying than a stormy sea outside your boat. It's to have the Lord of glory inside your boat. The all-holy Lord of glory who knows everything about you. And they're starting to get an inkling, this man is not just like one of us. He's different. In Matthew 17, when Jesus is transfigured, God spoke from heaven, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And the Bible says the disciples fell down to the ground and were terrified. And Luke chapter 5, Jesus tells Peter, cast your net on the other side of the boat because he hadn't caught anything all night. And Peter said, Lord, I'm the fisherman here. You're the teacher. Uh, but okay, at your word, I'll do what you said. He throws the net on the other side of the boat. They cat caught so many fish, they couldn't haul it <laughs> on, on board. The boat was starting to sink because they had so many fish. And what does Peter do? He falls at Jesus' feet and says, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He knew that Jesus was not just his buddy. <laughs> he, he, he was starting to get the conception I don't know if he knew he was God yet, but he knew he was much more than any ordinary human being. In Acts chapter 9, when the Apostle Paul had a vision of the risen Lord, he's knocked to the ground, blinded, and couldn't eat for three days. Trauma was associated with a visitation from God, an overwhelming dread, so that they, their body couldn't stand it, and they fall down on their faces, so when God appears to man, the only spontaneous response is to collapse in dread of his overwhelming glory. That's what happens when you meet God face to face. I remember John MacArthur in one of his sermons was talking about a, a charismatic pastor who was speaking to him about how Jesus appears to him while he's shaving each morning. And John MacArthur turns to him and says, well, do you keep on shaving? In other words... Are you really having a visitation from God? If you, if you were, you're not going to keep on shaving. You're going to be on your face. You're going to be like a dead man before him. So when the risen Lord appears to his people, his people don't start bursting into holy laughter. They don't start barking like dogs, which is some of the supposed manifestations of the presence of God coming down. They fall on their faces as though they were dead in dread of his holiness. That's what happens. So that's what John did. He fell at his face because he knew, I think it was because he knew that he was a sinner in the presence of pure, absolute, spotless holiness. The one, 
Not only who loved him, and he did. John was the beloved, the one who leaned back on Jesus' breast. But now he saw Jesus in all of his glory, and it was scary. What did John hear? This is the final thing we're going to talk about. We find that in verse 17 and 18. He heard, do not be afraid. And then he heard these words, I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last. Back up to verse 8 for just a moment. In verse 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Okay, Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. It's like us saying from A to Z, I am from A to Z. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the first. I am the last. I, I, I checked out the New World Translation this, this week. Their translation of verse 8 is, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says Jehovah God. They believe Jehovah God is the Alpha and the Omega. Okay, if that's true, and if Jesus calls himself in verse 17 the first and the last, keep that in mind, and then go to the last book of Revelation, or last chapter, which is chapter 22. I'm going to give you something here that you can use when you are talking to Jehovah's Witnesses. When they come to your door, you can open up the book of Revelation and talk to them. Because in chapter 22, verse 13, and notice this is Jesus talking. In my Bible, the words of Christ are in red. So verses 12 and 13 are in red because Jesus is the one speaking these words. He says in 12, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. The Father is not coming back. Jesus is. So these are, this is a message from Christ. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Now we just read that in chapter 1. Jesus is the first and the last. Jehovah God, according to verse 8, is the Alpha and the Omega, and Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now, if Jehovah is the Alpha and the Omega, and Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, then guess what? Jesus is Jehovah. And you can use their Bible, you can up their New World Translation and show them those verses and say, I can't escape the clear message here that Jesus is Jehovah. Of course, they believe he's not. They believe he's Mark the Archangel. He's created by God. But the Bible teaches that he is God in the flesh. Okay, so if Jesus is Jehovah God, and he's in the midst of the churches as their high priest, interceding for them, then it stands to reason they don't need to be afraid. He can lay his hand on John, who fell at his feet like a dead man, and say, don't be afraid. Because I'm in your midst. I'm your high priest. I'm interceding for you. And then he goes on to say, and the living one. I'm not only the first and the last, I am the living one. Now what would it mean that Jesus is the living one? I think it means much more than he's physically alive. We could say that about ourselves. We're physically alive, aren't we? But, but Jesus was, had life in a different sense than we had it. He is the living one, meaning that he is self-existent. He has life in himself. He doesn't derive his life from somebody else like we do. Every creature that God has made has to derive its life from its creator. God gives it life. You don't have it in yourself. Jesus has life in himself. He is the living one. <laughs> he, he never had a beginning. He'll never have an end. He just is. He is the I am. He, he didn't come into existence. He has always existed. Now this is so hard for us to get because we, we can't even conceive of anything not having a beginning because we're creatures. And everything we know about had a beginning. Even the mountains and the seas had a beginning. But Jesus Christ never had a beginning. He's the eternal I am, the self-existent one. In 1 John 5.11, it says, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. That's where this life is that Christians have. It is in Jesus, and he communicates it to us by virtue of our union to him. 
And then he goes on to say, and I was dead. I was dead. That's speaking about Good Friday. The crucifixion of Christ. Speaking about him dying for sin. Once for all. The just for the unjust. In order to bring us to God. I was dead. Jesus did die a historical death. And when he died. He took care of our sin problem. We stood guilty before God. Because of our many transgressions. And Jesus Christ atoned for them by paying the price of strict justice against sin. So this is the atonement when he speaks about I was dead. The propitiation. That sacrifice that removes wrath. That's what Jesus Christ was accomplished when he died. It was Jesus Christ becoming sin for us. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And he goes on to say, and I was dead, but behold, in other words, look, behold, I am alive forevermore. I was dead, but I've come back to life, and I'm going to be alive forevermore. Nothing will ever cause me to die again. I have this resurrection life within me. So if I was dead, refers to Good Friday, I am alive forevermore, refers to Easter Sunday, because that's what he could say upon his resurrection. Romans 6, 9 says, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. And then Jesus goes on to tell John, I have the keys of death and Hades. Now folks, what do keys do? They open, and also what else? Lock. They open what's locked, and they lock what's open. They speak about it. The person who has the keys has authority to lock something up or unlock it. Like when you rent a house, you're given keys. Now you've got the authority to enter or exit whenever you want to. Jesus has the keys of death. In other words, he has authority over the realm of death and he's got authority over the realm of Hades. And we need to unpack that this morning. What does it mean that he has the keys of death? It means he's sovereign over death. He has the right to go to the realm of death. Basically it's saying when Jesus says I have the keys of death. It's saying I have control over death. I decide who dies and when they die. And where they die. That's me. And you say, well, wait a minute. Jesus isn't the one who's in control over death. I mean, some people commit suicide. Other people are killed. They're murdered. And so Jesus isn't causing that. No, he's not causing that. But he is still sovereign. And he's still Lord over the, the human destinies of every person in this world. We know that because in Psalm 139, 16, it says, the psalmist says to God, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. So that's when he was in the womb. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. So God has a book. And in that book is written the number of days of every person who will ever live even before he, they've lived a single day. In other words, God knows and has ordained the destinies of, of, of all people. He has the keys of death. He can unlock death and bring you in. And he can unlock death and bring you out. Jesus is the sovereign Lord of death. But he also has the keys of Hades. He says here. Now that's something that's a little bit more difficult for us to understand. Because we don't use that term do we? Hades. There was an Old Testament word called Sheol. And there's a New Testament word called Hades. And they mean the same thing. It's the realm of departed spirits. When someone dies, their soul enters into this place called Hades. Now, all people enter into Hades. Some people, those who die in Christ, end up in a temporary heaven. Some theologians call it the intermediate state, because it's not your final destination. 
We'll talk about this in a minute. It's a temporary place where the righteous go to be with Christ. But there's also another place within this realm of Hades that's a temporary hell. We know that because in Luke 16, when the rich man and Lazarus come up in the story, the rich man, it says, lifting up his eyes in Hades, he was in torment in the flames. He was in Hades, and he was in the wrong place in Hades. He was in a temporary hell. Now, it wasn't the final hell, because the final hell in the Bible is called the lake of fire. And we're told in Revelation 20, after the final judgment, death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire. There's no more temporary holding place for, for the wicked. They're cast into the lake of fire, which is just another word for hell. Jesus has the keys of this place, the realm of departed spirits. He can unlock it, and he can lock it. Now, the temporary heaven. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says that to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. And Paul says in Philippians 1, he had the, de the, the desire to depart, to die, and be with Christ. So if you, if you are a Christian and you die, your soul goes to be with the Lord. You enter into this realm of Hades, but you go to be with Christ. But it's not your final destination. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 that when Christ returns, he's going to destroy this present earth and this present... Uh, heavens, and he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's your final destination. It's to be with Christ in this new heavens and new earth that he's going to create. But right now, there is an intermediate state where Christians go, those who love Christ, they go to this place and they're with him. It's a wonderful place, but it's not their final place because they don't have a resurrected body yet. And they will not be complete until the day of the resurrection when their soul is joined to a resurrected body and then that new person, that is you, this glorified person will live in the new heavens or the new earth, wherever the Lord decides, with Christ forever. That, that will be eternal heaven. Okay? So Jesus Christ, if he has the keys of Hades, is the only one who has the authority to admit you to that paradise that we're talking about. That part of Hades that is paradise, where the righteous go to be with the Lord. Even in our own judicial system, let's say somebody commits a crime. They're waiting for their trial. What happens to them? Well, they go to jail usually, unless they get bailed out. But let's say they don't get bailed out. They have to go to jail until their final uh, hearing and the judge pronounces their final sentence, right? This present temporary hell <laughs> is like jail. And the ultimate, final, eternal hell is like prison. And the, the thing that makes the difference is the judgment. When Christ returns, he's going to judge all people those that did not believe in Jesus Christ, they're going to go to an eternal hell. Those that did believe in him will go to an eternal heaven. Okay. This is what Christ communicated to John about himself. So do you realize what it means for Jesus to have the keys of death in Hades? It means that he has the authority to assign your eternal destiny. He will be the one. Do you remember in Matthew 25 when the king comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him? Then he shall sit on his glorious throne and he shall divide the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. What does he say to the goats on his left? Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus Christ is the one who says those words. What does he say to the sheep on his right? Come, you blessed ones, into the eternal kingdom, which has been prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. So two opposite sentences are going to come from the lips of this same one. Christ has the authority to cast you into hell or to receive you into heaven. What you do with Jesus Christ is going to mean the difference of your eternity.
Well, let's say, well, I, I really don't do anything with Jesus. I just sort of live my life. Well, by not doing anything with Jesus, you're doing something. You're ignoring him. He's commanded all men everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. And if you don't repent and give your life to him, then you're not doing what he's commanded you to do. You don't have the son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Everything revolves around Jesus. He is the subject of this book. Starting in Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, Christ is the theme of this book. And you ignore him or neglect him or reject him at your own eternal peril. He is risen. He is alive forever. He is the sovereign king of the universe. And he's calling all people everywhere throughout this world to drop to their knees to humble themselves before him, to confess their sins, and believe on him as Savior and King. He has the keys to the temporary heaven, he has the keys to the temporary hell, and he's the one that will make the, the difference in your life. Once he casts you into to the, the temporary hell, you, you will never get out. That's the scary thing. That's the terrifying thing about this. You, you cannot. It is impossible to get out of it. That same story in Luke 16 about the rich man and Lazarus, do you remember that story? There's a chasm, a great chasm between the one in Abraham's bosom, which was the poor man, and the rich man who lifts up his eyes in torment in Hades. There's a great chasm, and Abraham says, nobody from this side comes over to you, and nobody from your side can get over to us. Your fate is sealed. You're done. And it's not just a year, or even 10,000 years. It's forever. That's, th th those are the stakes That's why we shouldn't be glib about talking about the gospel because the stakes are so high. And no one who hears the gospel should just listen glibly as though, oh, that's, that's kind of amusing. That's kind of entertaining. Where you spend eternity is at stake and what you will do with Jesus Christ. It's good, it's bad news for the person who ends up in hell, but it's good news for the person who ends up in heaven because Christ has the keys to that place and he locks you in. <laughs> and you say, well, I don't want to be locked in anywhere. Well, you will, because you, you will, there, you, there'll be no other place that you'll want to be other than with him. The only reason we wouldn't want to be there is if we loved our sin more than we loved him. And when you get to this place, there's no more sin. You don't have a sinful nature anymore because you've been glorified and resurrected. There's no devil to tempt anybody there. There's no sinful, perverted world that's trying to drag you along to do its will. You are in a, a world of righteousness, and you love righteousness, and so you would never want to be any other place than with him in the kingdom of heaven. So, this Easter, if you are a Christian, rejoice! Because Christ has the keys, and he's admitted you into his kingdom. And you're never going to be kicked out again. You know what would have to happen? Have to happen for you to be kicked out of heaven? Christ would have to be kicked out of heaven. Because you are in Christ. You are joined to the Lord of glory. Your eternal comfort and salvation and glory is assured because of Christ. So that's means of rejoicing for you who believe in Jesus Christ. And if you're not a Christian, I guess from this text, the only thing I should say about that is, be very afraid. Tremble. Know what is at stake here. This is what comes from Psalm 2. The psalmist says, kiss the Son. Do homage to the Son. Worship the Son that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. 
How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Take refuge in Jesus Christ today if you're not a Christian. Put your faith in him. Walk in him. Trust him. Live in him. Serve him. Follow him. Make Christ your life. And you will experience everlasting glory with him. But if you don't do that, you will experience everlasting torment. So, come to Christ. He said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to Christ. Come to him in faith. Lord, I pray that you would cause the words of Scripture to come alive and to do its supernatural work in the souls of all of your people and even those who are not yet your people. Lord, draw unbelievers to faith and cause your believers to rejoice in the hope of glory that they have because of Christ and his perfect work, his absolute perfect work on the cross where he put away sin once and for all by the death of himself. We love you, Lord, and give you all the glory. May we live out this Christian life trembling. <laughs> May we rejoice with trembling, as your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.